Hello everyone. So in last episode, we show you a few methods of measuring RF signals by uh, having a near field probe, an RF current probe, and a whole effect sensor probe. And we throw you the question, right? Which waveforms do we trust? So in this episode, we're gonna have a look at the system diagram of these uh, measurement tools and explain a very important concept, which is the transfer impedance. Okay, so let's go. So we start with the first method, right? When we have a small square loop, Okay, and that square loop connected to a uh, coaxial cable, and that's then connected to a 50 ohm input impedance of the oscilloscope, and we look at the waveform, right, by doing this. So uh, what happened is you got an RF signals going through the wire on the test, and then you measure something. So the question really is, what is this? signal we're measuring right so if i draw this i can sort of do something like this okay so this is my uh the wire on the test i can represent it by just having an inductor and then i can i can then represent the loop i use by having something like this okay so if you look at it we have the self-inductance L1 of the wire on the test, okay? And we have current going through it, right? And this current, as we said, is a high-frequency current. Therefore, if I look at the voltage across this inductor, I can easily write down as V1 equals L1 di over dt, right? No problem at all. And then we said when we are using a near field probe to measure a wire, what we rely on is the mutual, the mutual inductance, right? So we've got a mutual coupling between the two. Therefore, if I look at the voltage developed here, right, I can call it V2, for example, then my V2 would equal MDI over DT. And we said that mutual inductance generally is smaller than the self-inductance, and so if you look at and di over dt are exactly the same amount as di over dt over here, right? So in a sense, my v2 will have exactly the same waveform as v1, but with a smaller amplitude, and that's it, right? And then, of course, having a small loop like this one, I will always have some small resistor, right? This is often in the tens of milli ohms, and uh, I also have my small self-inductance, okay? And we said this small inductance of a wire loop can be estimated by having a rule of thumb, which is 20 nanohenry per inch or 10 nanohenry per centimeter. So you can actually calculate this, uh, or estimate this inductance. And finally, this will be connected to the 50 ohm in input impedance of your equipment. So really, this is the simple circuit we have. So now if you look at this part with the L and R, okay, so let's ignore this, uh, this uh, R for the time being, okay, because this is too small, right? And this LR here, if you know, this actually acts like a filter. This is an LR filter, okay? So remember, the voltage or the signal you see on your oscilloscope basically is the voltage developed across this 50 ohm impedance, isn't it? So you can really treat it simply as a potential divider. This circuit here is a potential divider, LR, of V2. So what we're seeing here is by using a small loop to measure the RF signal. What you measure really is a voltage waveform, isn't it? Because we said V2 is just a smaller version of V1, and then you do a potential divider, depends on the impedance of L and R, then you arrive at the voltage you measure. So you are actually looking at a voltage waveform rather than a current waveform. So that's why in the, in the demo we did, what we saw is a waveform more like a pulse, isn't it? Like a spike pulse like this. That's because you're not actually measuring the current, but rather a voltage. So then that makes it, that makes sense because if you really want to see the current waveform, what you should do, right, is then do the integration. So if I do this, for example, 
v2 dt and I do on both sides of course di over dt dt and then of course this cancel out I have v2 dt equals mi right and then you put the m here so that would give you v2 dt so yeah if you can use the uh, fancy function of the oscilloscope and integrate the, the, the signal you measure, then you can arrive at the current waveform. Following our discussion, we said, really, this looks like a potential divider because this is like an LR filter, right? So what we can do is, now, the next, I'm going to draw a x-axis with frequency and y-axis as the voltage, basically the voltage I measure using oscilloscope when terminating the loop using a 50 ohm impedance. So I can sort of divide this circuit into two parts, right? So the first part is this mutual inductance part. And this is actually pretty simple and straightforward. I have a voltage that would e be equal to mutual inductance, which is a fixed value, di over dt. So in the frequency term, I can write it down as v2 j omega m i okay so my omega then equals 2 pi f so as my frequency increase my voltage will also increase right so what i can do is i can then draw something like this okay so this would be my uh, the sort of the response uh, regarding to the frequency but i only look at the uh, mutual coupling part Okay, the next, if I draw an LR circuit, like a, like a filter, right? So what, how it behaves will be, I'll use a different color, would be something like this, okay? And this is what we call a corner point, and this corner point will depend on the impedance of L and impedance of R, okay? So um, yeah, now we have two separate response curves in one circuit like this, right? So now the next is I add them together. If I add them together, then we arrive at something like this, okay? Again, different color will be like this. This is my final response curve, okay, in red. Final response curve in red. So what does this mean then? Well, clearly you can see there are two regions, right? If I divided this into two parts, so two regions. We have region one in the sort of lower frequency and region two in the higher frequency. We know that in the lower frequency region, it is more behaving like this, right? So you are measuring the voltage because here, look, this is the voltage. Voltage equals MDI over DT. So this is what we call voltage region, okay? And this part becomes what we call a current region. Why do we call it as a current region then? Because this bit is interesting because, again, look at the separate response curve. You got this voltage increasing, right, at this rate. And actually, this rate is 20 dB per decade, so quite linearly increasing. And then you also have the future response rule off at the same rate, but negative. So this is negative 20 dB per decade. So when, they, when you add the positive 20 dB per decade to the negative 20 dB per decade, you arrive at a flat curve like this, right? And this flat curve actually is pretty useful for us. You can calculate the current by simply doing I equals V over Z, and Z is the transfer impedance. And because in this frequency region, it is rather flat, okay? So what it means is, in this region, the waveform you see, right, in terms of voltage, actually represents the current waveform. It's just the amplitude is different, and the difference can be calculated by I equals V divided by the transfer impedance. Whereas we know that in this region, the current waveform is actually quite different with the voltage waveform. You can calculate it. If you integrate the current, you get the voltage. So it is a lot easier to, to look at the current waveform if you operate above the corner frequency range. But here's the thing. With a near-field probe, the L, the self-inductance, the mutual, is often in order of tens of nanohenry, right? And we terminate it using a 50 ohm um, resistor, 
at the end. So if you look at the corner frequency, you will find that this corner frequency is often above 100 megahertz, okay? So which means that below this frequency, which is 100 megahertz, right? you always operate in this voltage region, okay? Meaning that the waveform you see on the equipment is not a current waveform, it's a, rather a voltage waveform. Only if you use this method to measure the frequency content above the corner frequency, then the waveform you see is actually the current waveform. Then you can use this equation to calculate the current. So you can see the challenge of using a small near field magnetic loop. Now, if we look at the RF current probe, okay, like this, as we said, they follow exactly the same principle, right? So you still have the F here, and you have the voltage response here. However, if you remember our first episode, we discussed the difference between the magnetic field probe and RF current probe is that the RF current probe has much more inductance simply due to the fact that they have a magnetic field they have a core and they have often three five or seven or nine turns okay and don't don't forget the inductance value is proportional to the number of turns square so that means you have a lot more inductance when using an rf current probe this does mean the response curve start to change as well it has the same shape however it has a much longer flat region compared to a magnetic field probe. And this corner frequency point depends on the number of terms and how the manufacturers trimming the RF current probe. Remember, in episode one, we said the effective circuit of an RF current probe really is you got some uh, mutual inductance, self-inductance, then you have the core loss due to the um, magnetic field core, and you then have the termination, terminating resistor, and then you also have sometimes manufactured trimming the circuits by adding more uh, impedance here. So all of this means this corner frequency can be tuned. So that's why if you look at the transfer impedance data sheet of different models of a uh, RF current probe, you will find this corner frequency point often say in one megahertz, sometimes a hundred kilohertz or even lower, right? But the beauty of this is now above the corner frequency, as we mentioned, you are all operating in current region, meaning the waveform you see on the equipment now represent a current waveform rather than a voltage waveform. And then also you can easily calculate the current value by simply use I uh, equals V divided by Z. And Z is the transfer impedance of the RF current probe. But of course, in the world of EMC, we like dB. So if you do the logarithmic calculation of this equation, then things become even easier. We have dB, for example, microamps, right, represents your current level, becomes equals dB microvolts. Then minus dB ohm, okay? In the case of I have a 15 dB ohm transfer impedance RF current probe in the flat region, okay? And I measure the voltage, let's say I have a reading of 35 dB microvolts. Then my current can be easily calculated in terms of the unit is dB microamps, right? Equals 35 minus 15 then gives me 20 dB microamps. Of course, in most of the equipment we have these days, you can uh, import the transfer impedance of an RF current probe as a lookup table, and then the software simply does this simple calculation. So you, you can read the current directly from your measurement, okay? Let's close the session by having uh, some fun with the simulation model we built, okay? As you can see, the simulation model I built using symmetrics basically is based on the demo we did, okay? So in this first case, it's a uh, one megahertz square wave, right? We supplied in the signal generator as, as we did, and it's connected to a first small loop. And then we have another loop, basically, 
next to each other, right next to the first loop, to capture the waveform. And here you can see two inductance. And in order to make a uh, mutual coupling, if I press F11, you can see that um, I have a coupling factor about 0.5 in this case, as we discussed, right? So this is the case where you have two near field loops uh, next to each other. Okay, and uh, we got some self-inductance, and we connect this loop uh, with the 50 ohm resistor. That's really the simple model we built. Okay, so if I run it now, you should be able to see the waveform now, right? So you can see here the square wave as we measured is 5 volts peak to peak, 1 megahertz uh, switching frequency, and also you can see the uh, uh, waveform that that is measured by using this near field probe. Okay, so if we just look at the shape of the current or shape 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 of the voltage in in the sense, right? Because we are we're reading the voltage here. You can see probe two is a voltage reading. This is the pattern, and it has a sort of 150 millivolts uh, peak. So overall, we're talking about peak to peak about 300 and a little bit more millivolts. And if you compare this simulation results with the one we uh, with the demo we did, you find they are not far off, right? Obviously, this is a very very simple uh, simulation model, but the fact that it can capture the fundamentals we just discussed. So hopefully, this convinces you that this is the simplified model of a near field probe okay now moving to the second one okay so um, so this one remember rather than using two near field probes next to each other we swapped the other side using an RF current probe so this is my uh, model for the RF current probe okay just again to show the details when you insert a RF current probe as we mentioned, this inductance increased significantly compared to the previous one, right? Previous, pre previous one, we're talking about 13 nanohenry and then 0.5 um, mutual inductance. Whereas this one, because we have the magnetic core, we have mole terms, so this has much more inductance. And, uh, and uh, yeah, and then we added uh, 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 some uh, core, right? We mentioned there is core. Uh, due to the core resistance due to the uh, uh, ferro material, then some compensation resistance network that the manufacturer introduced. We added six picofarad as the parasitic capacitance. And let's just quickly run this and see uh, the results. Again, we're, we have the same uh, voltage pulse. And if you look at the shape of the current waveform, they're about two volts peak to peak, two volts peak to peak again not far off with what we measured, isn't it? Again, this demonstrates that uh, the discussion so far we had all makes sense, all makes sense, okay? So, um, yeah, and uh, lastly, right, based on the discussion we had, I can then basically create a very simplified uh, simulation model for my current probe, okay? So you can see this is TPCP2500, this is TPCP2750, if I run this simulation model, it's extremely fast because I'm doing a frequency range sweep, okay? And what I will do next is I go to probe, and then I select um, uh, which one? dB voltage, okay? So I'm going to point here. That gives me the first re reading, right? And then I go to, again, probe dB voltage, and I probe it here, right? So the reason I probe dB voltage is because I supplied a, a unit current, okay? So one amps current sweep from uh, almost like uh, one kilohertz all the way to one gigahertz. So this is the frequency sweep I did using uh, unit current. Therefore, when I plot dB voltage, that gives me dB ohm directly, right? Think about the math, right? So it's like uh, you minus zero dB uh, amps, and then uh, gives me the dB ohm. And this look, looking at the shape of these two uh, transfer impedance, right? And if you then compare this with the manufactured data sheet, you find they are again very, very similar. So this is my TPCP2750, which gives me about 20 dB ohm in the flat um, uh, current range as we discussed right this is pretty flat this is about 10 megahertz all the way to about uh, 500 megahertz and uh, and uh, yeah and then uh, 
the other one is uh, TBCP2500. That is about 16.6, .6, if I can remember, 16 point, yeah, 16 uh, dB ohm. And yeah, again, giving you the flat frequency curve. And you can also see that down in the lower frequency range, they behave slightly differently. And the corner frequency point for each uh, showing here as well. Okay, so yeah, uh, a lot to talk, right? If you think about it, just uh, transfer impedance. I'm sure we're going to have another episode to discussing uh, to discuss more uh, about transfer impedance. But for now, um, bye bye.